right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, so my name is Rod Tellis. I'm the CIO for Guyana Goldfields. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about our journey of uh, HANA on Azure. So a quick uh, summary. I uh, won't go read through that. You can have a look. That's what we're going to cover today. Uh, quickly, this is a little bit about Ghana Goldfields. So we're a mid-tier uh, gold producer based out of Toronto, Canada, and we have operations in South America. So here's the business case. So um, we had a requirement for a green fields implementation of SAP. Um, we had in phase one, we wanted to do FICO and MM. Um, we had users both as I mentioned, in North America and Guyana, obviously. And um, we were migrating off of a legacy ERP, which brings its own challenges. Um, and probably the biggest challenge when we were talking about infrastructure is uh, majority of the users are over this really skinny uh, satellite link with high latency. So that's actually where, uh, very close to this, this picture, is where the majority of the users are actually connecting to SAP from. What do we have for existing infrastructure? We had a local ISP in Toronto. We, we are running a lot of uh, our infrastructure on their public cloud and uh, on-premise hyper-converged infrastructure for locations that or workloads that are not a good fit for the cloud. So we went through a selection process. It ran for about four months or so. Uh, went through quite a regress, uh, rigorous selection process. Um, we looked at various different models for hosting uh, HANA. Um, so we went with, we looked through on-premise with co-location, really extending our hyper-converged infrastructure to support the SAP workload. Um, we looked at hybrid cloud. Uh, so essentially, there were certain cloud providers that could not support HANA, um, but could support all the rest of the infrastructure. So looking to how to kind of slice that keep a piece of it private, a piece of it public, and try and make that more cost effective. Um, public cloud, of course, and then we even looked at bare metal servers uh, for different, uh, from different partners, some of them are here, um, to be able to see if we could uh, really own the whole stack. So we're looking at all, that, all those models. Um, we received these bids, so we finally had, had one hybrid cloud, three private, two public, and two on-premise. Um, uh, proposals. So what was the criteria, right? Um, orchestration and visibility of infrastructure was key for us. So something that we learned, we forayed in the cloud about four years ago, uh, where we moved a lot of our infrastructure into a public cloud. And one of the big drawbacks that we came across with that provider was complete opacity. Once the workload was in there, we had very limited control and we had very limited visibility. And it actually, instead of it enabling us to be more agile, it actually slowed us down because we always had to go through that third party provider to make changes. So that was our number one um, criteria, is we wanted to make sure if we were going to continue to use cloud, we wanted to make sure we had visibility um, and superior orchestration uh, tools that we could leverage ourselves. Scalability and commercial viability for existing data centers. So we obviously knew that we don't want to have infrastructure spread all over the world um, unless we needed to, of course. So we wanted to make sure the cloud that we we're going to choose or the destination, I should say, for SAP was going to be able to handle the rest of our non-SAP workloads as well so that we could collapse that uh, into one stack and really own that stack. Uh, data, tra data traversal costs. So if you're looking at any of the cloud, major cloud options out there, you will know that there are data traversal costs, especially for egress data. So that's something that we were very cognizant of and made sure that we were bringing that option um, or, or making sure that that criteria had a, a high weightage. Uh, disaster recovery and multi-cloud strategies uh, you know, I'll talk about those together. So, of course, we didn't pull a, uh, a disaster recovery scenario into phase one of the infrastructure, but we wanted to make sure that when we were ready to do that, we'd be able to scale and we had 
reliable SAP tested disaster recovery scenarios that we could turn on quite easily without having to um, you know, fall back to some of the other models uh, that I talked about. And multi-cloud, so we wanted to make sure again that another issue that people have when they go to the cloud is cloud lock-in, right? And what we wanted to make sure that we had that flexibility that somewhere down the line, for whatever reason, we wanted to have workloads in multiple clouds for redundancy purposes or you know, for, for a service that we thought that would be better, a better fit or a better service from another cloud, we were not locked in. And definitely with some of the uh, partnerships we've seen with Azure on uh, cloud exchanges, that becomes a fairly compelling story. Um, something that people don't or you know don't normally put up on a cloud selection criteria is vendor relationships and I think this weighed more heavily than I expected when we started on this journey is in all of the um, um, different models that I was talking about uh, vendor relationships played a big role because this was new for us we had never run HANA before um, we were moving probably our crown jewel so to speak to the cloud and having that relationship with the vendor to, uh, to help us design, to help us validate, uh, and, and also to, to get out to re reference clients played a big role in, in us being comfortable enough to do this. Of course, cost without saying, goes without saying. This was a major component of, as well. <clears throat> and as I'm here, you probably guess we selected Azure, right? <clears throat> so we, we went into the design phase, um, and then we went about selecting a partner for the Microsoft Azure implementation. Uh, we entered the infrastructure design phase and the SAP partner design validation. Uh, this was kind of interesting because our SAP system integrator had never deployed HANA on cloud. So it was a journey that we had to bring them along for. So they had a lot of questions and concerns about HANA in the cloud. You know, at the end of the day, they were going to be responsible for performance, and they wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be this finger pointing at the, you know, during UAT. So we brought them along for that ride, and a big thing that helped us was the Microsoft and SAP um, joint architecture design session. So Microsoft hosted this for us. You know, we, uh, we had done a lot of prep work, but we were able to compress that down to a day and a lot of the issues we had around design, concerns about um, you know, latency, and really, I'd say the system integration, integrator concerns were alleviated through that session. So definitely you know, talks back to my point on the vendor relationship. It's not just about buying a product and being a great product. You need that engineering and pre-sales assistance to help you along that journey. And, um, what we did discover early on, right after I'd say the design session, is we needed to retool. A uh, number of our resources needed some retooling to be able to understand. We had traditional data center experience, but they needed some new skill sets in order to support this infrastructure in the cloud. So we entered the build phase. We had a very short timeline, about four weeks, in order to, um, in order to keep our project on schedule. Um, there was a steep learning curve, and this is the funny part, is it wasn't just a steep learning curve for us, it was a steep learning curve for our Microsoft Azure partner as well, which is not really where you want to be uh, in the middle of a four-week sprint. Um, so what ended up happening is uh, we were up against a very, very tight timeline, and the Ghana Goldfields team started to retool their skill set, and we did a large part of the build last part of any, uh, the complex part of the bill anyways. Um, and you know, this is where SAP requires a certain support level from, um, uh, from the client, for the client to have in order to support SAP on Azure. And at first I balked at the kind of the price list, uh, oh sorry, the list price, uh, but this really came in handy during this phase. Um, you know, we were able to lean on Microsoft level three engineering to help us get through some of the roadblocks as we were going up that learning curve. Um, and you know, it was 30 minute response time. We were able to get on calls and get through architectural issues. Um, instantaneous data protection. So, you know, 
I, I, I'm a big fan of this. You know, you, during build, sometimes what gets missed is, okay, we're still not in production. Do we really need to have a robust data protection strategy? Um, with, with a cloud platform, and especially in Azure, it's a click of the, it's a checkbox, right? And your data is protected. And it helped us. So during, Q, um, during our data loads, uh, post UAT, we actually had a major misload that was required us to recover our QE environment and would have really um, set us back and we would have definitely not finished on schedule. Um, but because you know, we had just turned that data protection on, it was doing its thing without us even thinking about it, we were able to recover that um, you know, in, a, in a couple of hours and, and be able to reset and keep the project on schedule. So we did consider express routes. Um, that was part of our pricing model uh, when we went through the um, comparisons. However, once we actually had the infrastructure up and running, especially for dev and queue, we realized we didn't really require it. We ran our numbers in terms of data traversal costs again, and we decided that we wouldn't really require the express route. So we went with IPsec VPNs, saved um, a big chunk of our budget there, and those cost savings helped me fill the, uh, you know, the scope creep and the change request for the business application. So it was a nice win there that allowed us to get more value to the business, customize SAP more, and keep costs uh, under budget. So go live. Um, you know, go live was January second. Um, it's sometimes I, I think go lives are, um, you know, a bit of an anticlimax. You pull the trigger and, and see what happens. Uh, it was an anti-climax. Like everything went really well. It was quiet. We didn't have major issues. Um, you know, remote clients. One of the big um, uh, benefits that we got is these remote clients in that, you know, uh, out in the middle of the northern Amazon jungle, suddenly had a much better um, user experience. So we were initially uh, on our old ERP. We were actually. Um, connecting using a VDI technology um, and even using uh, just uh, fat clients for SAP over the sapling on Azure, they had a massive improvement in performance. So I'll have to give credit also to the SAP client that's very uh, efficient uh, and especially can be tuned for high latency issues. Uh, but that was a big win for us. Um, Sounds small, uh, but it really helps you, especially close to go live. No password resets in week one, right? And we did that because we invested in single sign-on for Active Directory for our fat clients, and Azure AD SSO for our Fiori. So essentially, you know, from day one, I've been through a couple of go lives. Generally, week one is how do I get into the system? For us, it was a double click and you're in. So it, that really helped get through, you know, the very first hurdle. So I got a little video for you guys. That's what Go Life feels like, right? And that's from our mind. So all the images and videos are from our mind. So post Go Life. Um, so we continued hypercare for about six weeks. Um, successfully closed our first quarter um, on time. Actually, we, we closed it approximately the same amount of time that we used to uh, prior to SAP. Um, and we, when we're continuing to improve that, but that was that was one of the big risks that we were concerned about. We were able to do that on time. Um, some of the wins were our procure to pay cycle reduced dramatically, um, and that was mostly around approvals. Right, what helped us was Fury, email notifications, and our release strategy redesign. So we had learned a lot of lessons through the legacy ERP on uh, our release strategies and we brought that into the new, uh, new implementation. It, it really improved our, our, our cycle times. Um, so we did require, I mean, we, it, was, it was fairly successful. So we started to get uh, different uh, business units that were not part of the initial implementation that wanted access. Um, so they, we started to scale up the number of users and we ran, ran into a point that we needed additional resources. And this is another big benefit of, of, of course, being in the cloud. So we booked a 30 minute outage. It was actually done in about five minutes. We scaled up, bought production back online, um, and we're up, up, up and running. And this was about a month or two months into Go Live. So it was a big reputational risk there in terms of, you know, we made this bet on Azure, you know, how well is it going to work? But it worked really well. So, yes, question. You already say how much of an outage, 
How much of an outage did you have for the go-live? Uh, for the scaling up? No, not for the scale up, the actual go-live. Ah, so for the actual go-live, we cut off, uh, we did a phase cutoff. So we did cut off certain, uh, like master data, about 20 days before the year end. And we cut off transactional data about three days before go live. So we had done a lot of test loads, uh, you know, for about I'd say all the all the way through the project, literally from uh, blueprinting phase, we were loading. So we were able to cut that transactional load down to about three days. Um, and of course, uh, title of the presentation. So we have realized we're about in month six after go live. We have realized about a forty percent cost reduction over our legacy and uh, also comparing the closest competitor in the other models that I talked about. Uh, so from an OPEX, that's been a, uh, you know, a big help to us. Um, and we have actually taken that budget and reapplied to continuous improvement on the SAP uh, application itself. So it's helping us keep that momentum. It's not, you know, you, you know, you've got a new baby and you leave it on the floor. You've got to give it that care. Uh, it's helping us fund that care. Um, so one of the other things that we did, as I mentioned, we started out just after design phase, is we needed a retool, right? So we continue to invest in training for our team. Um, and uh, with that, we were able to keep our headcount flat and support this new infrastructure in Azure, which was really one of the goals we had on the onset, right? Is having that orchestration, visibility, and control, um, and you know, doing it with the people we had. So, we definitely had some resistance from our traditional stack uh, admins when we started this journey. Um, however, once they went through that design phase, and especially during the build, they became big fans of, of the platform. So we have a, uh, we are now, in fact, my team is the one who pushes me when we have a new workload that, you know, why don't we do it in the cloud? Why don't we do it in Azure? So that that's was an, a great win for me personally. So some lessons learned, just a few. Um, pick the right partner. So, you know, we didn't do enough of due diligence on our Microsoft um, implementation partner. Uh, that caused us a lot of heartburn during that design and build phase. You know, they, our partner had done, so they had references, they had done work on Azure, they had deployed workloads, but they had never done it at an enterprise scale. And they had not done it with, you know, data center best practices in mind. So the minute we started to push at that, it, it fell over pretty quickly. So that was a big, that was something that, you know, I would definitely do differently is pick the right partner, um, make sure they're adding value. In our case, we had to pick up the pieces and keep the ball rolling. Uh, give yourself more time in the design phase. Uh, you know, we really had to rush that. We made that, we kept the decision on which platform to go with uh, pretty late in the game. So we had to rush through the design phase. And you know, I think we got a, a very uh, healthy design in, uh, in the end. Uh, but however, it was a very rushed experience. So I would definitely give yourself more time, not only for the business application, but your infrastructure design as well, especially if it's your first foray into Azure. Um, I've mentioned it three times. I'll just say it again. Invest in training for your team, right? You need their buy-in. You don't need it just for the project. You need their buy-in post-go life. You need them to be fans of the platform. So you got to invest in that. And uh, be conservative with your resource specifications. This could be a bit controversial, but this is my opinion. Is one of the big reasons you go to the cloud is you can scale. So you can be quite conservative, um, or sorry, I should say aggressive in terms of your resources. Um, that's all fine and well, but you know you you don't want to go that aggressive that it hurts your cost models and your cost projections for infrastructure, right? So you want to be kind of, it's, it's a balancing act, but you want to have a, um, a, um, a resource uh, design that is not too skinny and not too bloated, right? Uh, because of course, you want to take advantage of, of the cloud. And uh, that's it. Uh, any questions?